Well then, Bunny, it's the last Pope on Film episode of the holiday season. Yes. Which means, which means that it is time once again to dust off what might be the worst Christmas movie ever made. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about the 1972 Bizarre Kitty movie, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. Now, this is episode 154 of the Pope on Film podcast, and we now cover this movie, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, every year for Christmas. This is the yes. second year in a row that we have covered Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. The first time that we discussed Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny was way back in episode 105. Yes. And because I keep ridiculously detailed notes, I have those notes right here in my hand. I've still got the notes from episode 105. And yeah. so it is an yeah, it is an interesting look at uh, uh, the podcast for exactly from one year ago. It's interesting to see what what we were up to, what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, in episode 105, we were still, still talking about the new Gilmore Girls movies that Netflix came out with. Yes. Despite having just done two full episodes of the show about them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it says right here, speaking of last week, we were talking about the end of Gilmore Girls and who could be the father. I forgot to mention another obvious candidate, Dean. Yes. What? Dean could be the father of Rory's baby. Dean who's <laughs> Sam. Not Dean who's Dean. <laughs> Yeah, Dean who is Sam. Yeah. Not Dean who is Dean. I hate Dean, Dean, Sam. I hate Dean, Sam. I am fine. Yeah. Dean, Sam? Yeah. No. Sam, I am. <laughs> also, during last year's episode, uh, I was very upset about the recent Harry Potter Midnight Magic Party that we had. Yeah. Because the weekend before... Uh, we had a, uh, a Harry Potter Midnight Magic Party, and I told everybody when they were setting up the Midnight Magic Party, I said, hey, I've run about four of these all by myself. And I had a Harry Potter club for kids for about five years, and uh, I know Harry Potter, and I, uh, I'm really good with kids, and so I can help in any way that you guys want me to. I, I, I've I have a number of Harry Potter activities and I know Harry Potter and whatever you need me to do, I will do. And so they said, great. Well, you're definitely going to work the midnight magic party. So they had me work the midnight magic party and that's it. Okay. I was very upset about that. They had me do nothing else. And I was telling kids for like weeks, I'm going to be at the midnight magic party. If you guys want to be at the midnight magic party. And so I would have kids coming up saying, hi, Mr. Steve, what are you doing today? Oh, just walking around. <laughs> Why? What are you doing? Because I because they gave me nothing. I, I did nothing that night. It felt like a big waste for me. Yeah, it was a successful event, but nobody cared too much uh, uh, about me because they didn't give me anything to do. And then and then uh, they they said that they wanted me to have an event too, so they had me do a midnight match, a Harry Potter story time activity thing and it was a successful event but it was after the harry potter midnight magic party and so no one cared about what i was doing a reporter came in took one look at me and took the hell off <laughs> so that was, that was fun yeah so for homework last year we watched the first installment of the batman serial oh yeah 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 um, Cereals. That may have been the last cereal we did because I'm just not a big cereal fan. Yeah. I, I yeah, I think that's the only cereal that we did, but it was Batman, so we had to do it. Yeah, yeah, we it, had to. It was but historically every, valid. Yeah, every cereal is always oh, there's no way that our hero can escape 
be sure and watch us next week and then in the beginning of next week oh our hero easily escaped via a way that we didn't show you before yes <laughs> yeah batman the original serial episode one the electrical brain 1943 during mm-hmm. the height of wwii they really didn't like the japanese in the serial, he was originally the he was he was called the Batman. So this is before Lorelai Gilmore told the studio to drop the V. Oh uh, yeah. We were very Gilmore Girls one year ago. Netflix really had <laughs> us by the short series. Yes. The, the Batman serial added a number of items to the Batman mythology for the first time. For example, the Batcave didn't exist until it was created for the Batman serial. Also, in the Batman serial, the entrance to the Batcave was behind a giant grandfather clock. Also something that a number of other Batmans used, mm-hmm. and that was just for this. Plus, Alfred is a skinny guy and not what he originally was in the comics, which was a bumbling fat guy. Yes. We also talked about the fact that in the the Superman radio show, they invented kryptonite just so that the guy who did the voice of Superman can actually have a day off every once in a while. <laughs> and I'm so sick of being Superman on the Superman radio show. I can't get a week off. Why can't a Superman be missing or sick or, oh, he's perfect? Well, why don't we give him a weakness? I don't know. Kryptonite. What the hell? Let's go with that. <laughs> I I always like those things in a comic book mythology that everyone loves, but that, oh, hey, guess what? Uh, Harley Quinn was created for a cartoon on the WB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was created for a cartoon on the WB. You know why? Because they wanted a character to be voiced by their favorite soap opera actress. That's why (laughs) you have Harley Quinn. Hey, you know Lois Lane's best friend? You know where she came from? The TV show Smallville. (laughs) You know the actress that played her? She's now in a sex cult. (laughs) Seriously, Google Smallville actress sex cult. Really? She's in yeah, she's in some crazy cult now. That 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 blonde girl uh, uh, comic relief from Smallville. So uh, we also talked at length last year about something that is still very important to me, something that is near and dear to my heart, something that I cannot talk enough about. I am talking, of course, about John Cena's Instagram account. Yes. This man is too weird for his body. <laughs> And, and, and see, the other day, there he did, um, he was on, uh, what is it, what is that talk show that everyone loves but now everybody hates? Jimmy Fallon, The Jimmy Tonight Fallon. Show, The Tonight Show, The Tonight Show. He was on The Tonight Show, and he did Mad Lib Theater, where, uh, like, the first five minutes are just Jimmy Fallon doing Mad Libs with John Cena, and then... They immediately after that go into a uh, a, a scene of a, of a skit where all of the things that they say are what John Cena came up with during the Mad Lib portion. Uh huh. And um, some of the answers that John Cena gave were so. It, it, it's not that the answers that John Cena gave were so weird and bizarre and out of left field, but the weird part was that he was able to come up with them so rapid. Yeah. Like, like literally, John Cena says, "What is an ad- what?" Uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon says to John Cena, "What is advice that you would give to a?" teenage boy and immediately without even thinking he just blurts out stay gold pony boy (laughs) nice and everyone's laughing and laughing and then it's like okay this is the okay so so this is a a good reason why this man has the weirdest instagram account (laughs) the man who comes up with these answers 
and it's, and, it's and full Jimmy circle. Fallon's like, hey, give me a description of moist, moist. <laughs> Like, like, it really, like, he comes up with, like, the weirdest answers at, at, at a moment's notice off the top of his head. And I'm like, yeah, okay, this is the guy with the weirdest Instagram account in the world. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, yeah, everyone should go see, again, everyone should go see John Cena's Instagram account. It's amazing. Yeah. So I hope that this will be a tradition for us every year. We will watch the same shitty movie and roast it. Now, this year... We wanted to do the Jack and the Beanstalk version, but for the life of me, I could not find the Jack and the Beanstalk version. The only version that I could find that had the Jack and the Beanstalk, I, I could, I found one version of Santa Claus and the Money that had Jack and the Beanstalk in it. Yeah. But it was, it, it, Riff Tracks Live did it. Riff Tracks made did Riff Tracks did Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, but then when they did Riff Tracks Live present Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, they said, "Hey, uh, how many of you have seen our Riff Tracks Live of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny?" And everyone's cheering, and they said, "Yeah, that's what we thought. That's why we're doing the Jack and the Beanstalk version this time." <laughs> and as far as I could tell, that's the only available place where you can find the Jack and the Beanstalk version of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, but I couldn't find Riff Tracks Live Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny for free, and I'm not paying any amount of money for Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny because fuck that. <laughs> yes. And I looked I and looked and looked. Yeah, I just looked and looked and looked. I couldn't find it anywhere. So, I'm not cheating here. But for the stats, I've got my notes from last year. It's an interesting story of the making of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. This week's movie is so bad that a lot of people, including some people out there who consider themselves bad movie lovers, have never even heard of this movie, let alone seen it. It's an under-the-radar sort of a bad movie. The basic plot is that Santa Claus who it should be noted rates a 9.5 on the Joe Don Baker sweat meter. <laughs> yes. Santa Claus crashes his sled on a beach in Florida and a bunch of uh, uh, people try and get Santa out of the sand. Then out of nowhere, a whole different movie breaks out. Uh-huh. Oh, ho, ho, kids, don't worry. I'm sure I'll get out of this. In fact, let's watch another movie. And so... The mo- and then the movie within a movie is actually much, 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 much longer than all of this Santa crap. Um, actually, there's another bit to this because in the movie within a movie, the character of Thumbelina visits a pirate-themed theme park in Florida post-Disney. They visit Pirate Land and Amusement Park for no reason whatsoever. So it's a movie within a movie within a movie. It's a, it, it's a bad movie-ception. Yes. Um, so this is a 1972 kids movie, and it's important to note that at that point in time in Hollywood, um, basically all of Hollywood seemed to think like, oh, let's make a movie. Let's make a good movie, a smart movie. This would be a funny movie. This would be a great movie. Oh, this is a movie for kids. OK, remember, everybody, kids are stupid. Yes. Remember, everybody, kids are really fucking stupid, so let's just dumb this down, okay? Let's dumb this down. Let's dumb this down. Uh, what level are we at? We're at Santa Claus Conquers the Martians? Okay, we need to be lower than that. This is a movie for kids. <laughs> so, in order to talk about Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, we need to talk about nudie cuties. I was obsessed with nudie cuties for a while. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to be a big fan of the monster of Camp Sunshine, which, <laughs> which is basically like, which is basically like Jason, except Jason is attacking a nude, a, a nude resort. They should totally do that. It, it, yeah, yeah, that's the monster of Camp Sunshine. Nudie Cuties were softcore nude movies from primarily the 50s and 60s, featured uh, some toplessness, select bottomlessness, no vagina, uh, and 
the literally the broadest humor this side of hee haw. <laughs> yes. Uh, nudes on the moon. Nudes. Uh, Nakedsville, USA. Uh, Naked University. Nudes Topless on the Be- Nudes on the moon. Isn't that one from uh, Chesty Morgan director? Yes, Doris Wishman. Yes. I was shocked that I knew that name immediately. <laughs> there is something wrong with me when I cannot find my keys or where I put my cell phone, but you say uh, you say nudes on the moon, and I go, yes, of course, that was Doris Wishman. <laughs> like, that's the knowledge I can easily regurgitate. Yeah. So... Nudie cuties were a thing. Dimly lit grindhouse theaters full of men in long trench coats. Um, The leading director in the world of nudie cuties was a guy by the name of Barry Mahon. Yeah. He was a veteran in World War II. I know this because Wikipedia, and I'm like, uh, a lot of times we do a bad movie, and so you look up Wikipedia, I'm going to Wikipedia this movie, and here's like a small Wikipedia page. And then you go, oh, uh, there's a uh, there's a thing for the director, I'm going to click the director's name, and here's a little thing for the director. Uh, Barry Mahon has one of the longest director's Wikipedia pages in the history of Wikipedia. And I'm like, wait a second, why does this director have like a have like a, a Guillermo del Toro length fucking Wikipedia page. Yeah. It turns out he was in World War II and he was taken prisoner and he uh, got a bunch of the other prisoners and together they uh, make a, a, an escape and they were successful and they made a movie about it called The Great Escape. <laughs> yes. The movie The Great Escape that. is a prequel to Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. <laughs> it's important to note this. Barry Mahon directed over 60 films in his lifetime. He was also a prolific producer in junk. Um, he So much of his first films were nudie cuties. Forbidden Flesh, Nudes on Tiger Reef, The Love Cult, The Beast That Killed Women, Nudes A Go-Go, Bottoms Up, The Diary of Knockers Macala. <laughs> that sounds that sounds like a character in a cut scene of a video game. Yeah. Like I can already like I can if I can close my eyes I can picture the video game that features you going into a saloon and talking with Knockers Macala who gives <laughs> you your, your next task. Yeah. But he also directed such great non-nudie stinkers as Pagan Island, Cuban Rebel Girls, and Rocket Attack USA, which was in a very early episode of Mystery Science Theater. It's a Joel episode, and Joel episodes are always really, really good. Yes. I never like Mike. And I and uh, Jonah Ray, who is now the host of Mystery Science Theater. They, let me tell you what I do not like about Jonah Ray. Okay. Now that we got Hulu, I've been binge watching uh, Drunk History anytime that I can. And um, he is in an episode of Drunk History. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. I am Jonah Ray Rodriguez. Okay. And I'm going to be telling you the history of Hawaii. And oh, he's Jonah Ray Rodriguez, and he goes nowhere with his career. He just becomes Jonah Ray, and guess what? You're the new Joel. Yeah. <laughs> my new I in in fact, I'm just going to go by my first name and my middle name, and that's going to I'm going to become a huge star. Now my name is just Stephen Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Steve Christian. Hi, Steve <laughs> Christian. I'm in insurance. Is is that your real middle name? Yeah. Oh, how'd they do that? Uh, to you? My 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 real name, which I hate, is Esteban Cristian Galindo. <laughs> and when I tell people my real name, they go, "Oh, I like the name Esteban. That's really nice." And I go, "Yeah, I hate it." And they say, why do you hate it? And then I say, well, if someone's name is Esteban, there are a lot of things you can say, like 
this man speaks Spanish, and this man has a culture that he knows about. Yeah. So, Psych. yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. So I, I just absolutely hate it. But it's important to note that my dad made a big, huge point of naming my older brother after him and passing the name. And when the second child came along, um, my wife went to my 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 mom went to my dad and said, so what should we name this second child? And my dad said, oh, I don't care. I already have my firstborn son. Oh. So so this one can be named whatever you want. And so my mom being my mom said, OK, because I'm reading a book and there's a character and his name is Stephen Christian. He's a Nazi, but he's one of the good ones. <laughs> He's one of the really good Nazis, and he's like the hero Nazi that saves the day. And my dad just went, okay, whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm named after Stephen Christian, the Nazi, which the is Nazi. horrible, which is horrible. But on the positive side, they, they did make a movie about this book, and I was played by Marlon Brando. So mm, I guess that's OK. Yeah, it's, it's slightly better. So he's a good Nazi. So the story goes like this. Barry Mahon, uh, he escaped in World War II, and then he's making nudie cuties. But eventually the nudie cuties just dry up in the 60s because people, because in the beginning of the 60s, they're like, ooh, we can still make these movies where you might be able to see a woman's boobs. But then the 60s keeps going, and suddenly there's all this, like, uh, violence and rape and so suddenly seeing uh nude chefs isn't <laughs> a viable option for making a quick buck so in so then in the late 60s in dania florida they open up a 78 acre theme park called pirates world mm -hmm. and uh it's a theme park and it's pretty big but it's even bigger as a concert venue david bowie played there the rolling stones the grateful dead led zeppelin so 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 this was a, a big theme park and an even bigger concert venue and everybody played there and it was huge and they were making a huge amount of money until suddenly walt disney right before he died said we're making a park another <laughs> park. we're calling it walt disney world it'll be the first ever Theme park in Florida. Aww. Yes, I Walt Disney right before I died. I'm making Florida's first theme park. <laughs> Thank you, Bella. Uh, thanks to me, Walt Disney, we're going to make Florida great again. <laughs> Everybody used to walk around with Mafaga shirts. Mafaga, <laughs> Mafaga hats. <laughs> Make Florida great again. Mafugga. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, Bella. That was great. You you did really, really, like, kudos to you. You get a gold star. Yes. So suddenly, Pirate World is struggling, and the owners are desperate to try and bring people to the frickin' park. So they came up with... What if we make a series of really cheap ass movies in the park, around the park? And so the movies will advertise the park, the park will advertise the movies. And as it so happens, um, uh, Mr. Nudie Cutie Barry Mahon had just stopped making nudie cuties because no one wanted uh, uh, cutesy tongue in cheek nude films anymore. So he just started making cheap low budget kids movies he did a uh, wizard of oz he did a thumbelina he did a jack and the beanstalk and he's like not sure what to do next and so um he's he's said no so he's so he's done thumb he's done the he's done jack and the beanstalk and he's working on a place to do thumbelina and the wizard of oz and he has no place to film and as it just so happens uh pirates he's looking for a place to film in pirate world say hey you're a director looking to make a movie hey come on in we'll let you film your wizard of oz film here and uh what other movie you want to do thumbelina that's great too now let's let me talk to you about our plans <laughs> so after the oz movie barry mahon makes a series of movies with pirates world as its center uh 
yeah, and 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 so he made Jack and the Beanstalk there. He made Thumbelina there. He did a musical documentary, and uh, all these three came out in 1970. And by 1971, Walt Disney World was actually open, and so a uh, pirate world declared bankruptcy in 1973 but they said oh it, maybe maybe we can still survive if we just come up with one more movie barry mahon make another movie for us and barry mahon said great there's only one problem uh i have no money do you guys have any money and pirate world is like oh we don't have any money so they, oh so how can we make a movie with no money and so instead of creating a new movie they just filmed about you know 20 minutes of silent film footage that they badly dubbed later yeah. and then shoved one of their pre-existing into the middle of it. And that is the story of Santa Claus and the ice cream bunny. <laughs> it's amazing. It is incredible. It is a cheap ass film. It is stupid and dumb and wonderful. And, uh, I love this film. I love this film, and uh, it really is a great film to show to people. To you know, because there's a lot of people out there, a lot of people out there that don't realize the importance of Life Day. No, and you really gotta. You know, if you want to show someone how important Life Day is, this is a great, a great film to show them. You know. Yeah. You're right, and and what it means, and about friendship too. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got a massive plot synopsis, but I don't think it's it's uh it, it, I don't think it's necessary. This movie is shit. Yeah. Basically, yeah. 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 So um, that's all I got. Uh, we are going to be taking the week off next week. Um, just because we just haven't taken a week off for a while. Yeah. But next, but the, our next episode, uh, episode 155, Jesus Christ, we're going to be, uh, for homework, we're watching Idol Busters. Yes. Idol, I-D-O-L Busters. Uh, I've got a, a, a brand new bit of news smatterings, which I'm very excited about. Okay. And um, I wasn't sure what movie we should do. I wasn't sure what movie we should do. And I was looking around for movies we should do. And then society told me what movie we should do. What did society tell you? We need to do Will Smith's new movie. The one on the made for Netflix thing? Yeah. As far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, it is a big budget summer blockbuster. It's just being released on December 22nd on fucking Netflix. But as far as I can tell, with the quality of the film, yeah, the effects and all of that, they literally Netflix could have just said, screw Netflix. Let's just release this in theaters like in May or June or July or August. And they could have made a shit ton of money. And I don't know why they didn't do that, because yeah. as far as I can tell, this is just a big, huge movie, a, a serious, actual film. It's just being released on my TV box in like six hours from now. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, I've seen the little things about it. It looks like some kind of science fiction. He's got some sort of alien partner or something. Yeah, it's basically like science, like a like a like fantasy is real, and so Will Smith is just a cop, but in a world of uh, orcs and elves and fairies and magic. So how do you, how are you how are you to be a cop in that world? So it's the last action hero, kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's the world needed another one of those. It yeah. might be good, but it might be shit. Either way, it'll be entertaining. And yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, the previews look good. I kind of want to see it. Let's do it. It's called Bright. Bright. That's a horrible name. It's like Will Ferrell and uh, Amy Poehler's The House. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a catchy film. There hasn't been a movie called House before. Except for the Japanese one. Yeah. And then the, 
80s horror movie one, and then the yeah. other 80s horror movie one. Mm-hmm. And then the house on the left. Yeah. I want to make a film called The House Next Door to the House on the Left. And so there's like yeah. the house on the so then there's like the house on the left, and there's like people being killed and rape. But then there's like the neighbors, the house next door to the house on the left, where the people are like, you know, the neighbor's bush is still growing into our yard. You should go over there and talk to them. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. And like someone in the house on the left is being like cut into pieces with a chainsaw, and but then the neighbors are like. <laughs> Do they have a chainsaw running? It's 945 and we have kids. <laughs> you should go over there and talk to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's my <laughs> that's my film. The house next door to the house on the left. I yeah. Yeah, I think that could be your winner. Uh, I think so too. Yay. But anyway, next week, next the next episode episode 155 that's going to be huge but until then i think this has been a good episode i think this has been a damn good episode i you know what i i agree i think this has been pretty good pretty good pretty good so until next week i am bunny williams and i am reverend steve and um so 2017 is 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 ending and I just want to say that I love you bunny. I love you. I love so you much. Rev. And thank you for still doing this podcast with me and it's really awesome and I love it and I love you and Jeannie and thank you and I appreciate all the hard work that you do for this podcast. Oh, thank and you. I, no worries. And I hope you have a really good Christmas and a happy new year. The very same to you. Okay. (laughs) So for Bella and Maxwell and Eleanor and Natasha and to a lesser extent, Emerald and Amber, I just want to say thanks for listening. Sincerely, thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you do swaffle. Thank you, Bella. Do, 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 do. Do not wipe your wet hands on Maxwell while he's sleeping. Who knows what he's dreaming about? He could be dreaming about Iron Man, and suddenly Iron Man is rubbing his wet hands all over him. <laughs> you're, you're, you're really fucking with his dreams, Bella. Don't do that ever again. Okay? He's dreaming that he's fighting Venom, and suddenly he feels his wet hands all over him. You just turned him into a symbiote. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Fucking with his dreams. Okay, I'll do it the next time we're off the podcast. Do not do it again. Do 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 do